Hey, well, good evening, everyone. This is Dan Welch with Emerging Revolutionary War. And joining me tonight on our next installment of ERW's Sunday Evening Revelries is historian and author Bert Dunkerley. Uh, before we get into our interview with Bert, who's got a brand new book in the Emerging Revolutionary War series, just want to thank everyone for coming along for our second annual Emerging Revolutionary War bus tour this past weekend. It was a great time uh, spent at Valley Forge, as well as exploring uh, the Battle of Monmouth with our ERW historians, Phil Greenwald and Billy Griffith. Uh, if you missed out this year, uh, we would hope to uh, see you next year for the third annual Emerging Revolutionary War bus tour. I don't want to give it all away just now, but, um, you know, there's an old adage that the war took place in other locations than just New England and the mid-Atlantic states. So um, look for uh, more information on the next bus tour uh, coming up here on the blog in the next several weeks. Uh, we hope that you will join us next year in 2023 for the third annual Emerging Revolutionary War bus tour. Uh, but with that, we are going to return back to the Mid-Atlantic and the New England colonies tonight as we look at Bert Dunkerley's new installment in the Emerging Revolutionary War series, Unhappy Catastrophes, the Revolution in Central New Jersey. So Bert, I got to start with, you know, tonight, probably the, the really big 30,000 Foot view question. Why central New Jersey? Why dedicate a, an entire book on, on central New Jersey during the American Revolutionary War? Surely everybody thinks Boston, everybody thinks Philadelphia. Um, you know, when we start talking about some of the important campaigns and battles, again, you know, the New York campaign, Saratoga, all those things happening up in New England and the, mid, in the uh, mid-Atlantic Pennsylvania. Why central New Jersey during the Revolutionary War? Well, Dan, first, thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm really excited to see the series launch, uh, move forward. It's been a while since uh, something's come out in the series. And I know there's some other good stuff coming. Uh, so looking forward to all that. Um, but to, to get to your question, um, I spent some time working at Morristown. And I really dove into the history. And I came to really appreciate uh, the revolution in that area there's it's just there's just so much it's fascinating and what really stuck stood out to me were a couple things uh, one is that the continental army spent about half the war in new jersey you know that the war starts in new england and then you know fighting shifts to the new york area and then they're in new jersey for a while and then you know they go to pennsylvania then they're back to new jersey and then down to virginia uh, for the Washington's main army, but uh, they're in New Jersey for a long time, for a lot of the war. And it's not just that. Uh, if you look at the war in New Jersey, you see the development of the Continental Army, because early in the war, we have a lot of New England units, and they have short-term enlistments, and those troops go home. A lot of the troops go home uh, on the verge of Trenton or soon after. And a new army is essentially raised and organized in New Jersey that spring of 1777. More troops from the mid-Atlantic states and the southern states. And that's the army that will fight in the big battles like Brandywine, Germantown, uh, Monmouth, and on to Yorktown. And so this is where that, that army that wins the war, that army that's going to fight in all the major battles that army is formed in New Jersey and receives their training and gets their experience there. And, and lastly, uh, you can understand so much of the war in New Jersey uh, from every angle, you know, military, obviously, but uh, political, uh, the tremendous number of loyalists. So you've got that internal civil war. You've got British occupied New York right next door. Uh, so politics, you can understand economics, uh, the state of New Jersey trying to keep the war effort going, trying to keep its economy afloat, uh, civilians, home front, the state, the whole state is a battleground. Uh, there's just so much to it. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that I'd like to dive into that, that you raised, you talk about how you know, the, the Continental Army keeps returning back to New Jersey over and over. And, and this past weekend, you know, we spent an entire weekend 
um, devoting time on, on, on the second annual bus tour at both Valley Forge and Monmouth. And I think when everyone, you know, immediately goes to Rev War Encampment, Continental Army, everybody goes to Valley Forge. Um, that is the thing that comes to mind. Um, tell us a little bit about the encampments in uh, central New Jersey, Morristown. Um, obviously, these encampments play a huge role in the life and the development of the of Washington's Continental Army. So if you could speak a little bit about that, if you have an excellent chapter on it in your book, and I know we can't put it all into this talk, but you know, if you kind of could make an argument, if you will, of, of why we need to remember the New Jersey encampments just as importantly as, as Valley Forge. Uh, not to take anything away from Valley Forge. I love Valley Forge. It's important. Absolutely. But we forget about places like Morristown. Uh, the winter at Valley Forge, most of the soldiers talk about being, you know, as a suffering as usual. Yeah, it's a crappy winter. Yeah, we're hungry again. Uh, Morristown was just awful. Morristown, tremendous cold. Uh, several snowstorms, several feet at a time. Uh, nothing could move. Supplies could not get in. Um, that, that's the one Morristown encampment that everyone thinks of. There was a, a previous one. There were two encampments at Morristown. The first one was not so bad. Uh, it was right after the battles of Trenton and Princeton. But the second Morristown encampment, uh, tremendous effort to keep the army together and uh, extremely difficult conditions. And if nothing else, you'll appreciate the sacrifice that these men made for the cause. But there were other encampments and campsites, places like Middlebrook, uh, Plukemen. Uh, the, the army develops its first training school. There's an artillery mm. school. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, the, the science of gunnery and organizing the artillery to be more efficient under Henry Knox. Uh, so the first Military Academy or Training Center is, is there in New Jersey. Uh, you know, you can talk about all the aspects that go into encampments like mutinies. Hmm. And there were uh, two, two large mutinies in New Jersey, uh, the Pennsylvania troops mutiny at one point, and they march away and eventually some of them get talked back into returning. A lot of them are allowed to just go home. And then New Jersey troops mutiny. Uh, later in the war. And it just, it goes to show that um, as the war drags on, things are getting really bad. The money is worthless. Supplies are, are uh, inadequate. And it challenges Washington's leadership. And he has to very, very carefully handle that. Uh, and he has to act swiftly. And he does because mutiny is, is contagious. And he realizes he has to contain it before it gets out of hand. And it leads me to another point about the, the whole supply issue. I've always had respect for Washington, but I really appreciated how he handled the supply challenges during that, that harsh Morristown winter. He came to realize that unless the, the army got fed off of the civilian population, the army would not survive. And the irony in that is that you have to take from the people you're trying to defend and protect. And of course, there's a fair number of loyalists too, who are going to point out the irony of that. And so what Washington does is he comes up with a system to requisition supplies, but he goes through the local civilian authorities, through the county courts, and the county judges, and gives each county a quota to supply the army. And I just want to read a quote from Washington's writing talking about this. I'm persuaded that you will not forget that we are compelled by necessity to take the property of citizens for the support of the army on whom their safety depends. We should be careful to manifest that we have a reverence for their rights and wish not to do anything that necessity and even their own good do not absolutely require. So Washington had a real reverence and respect for civilian authority and, uh, and certainly knew that what he was doing was going to be hard on the civilians and unpopular, but he tried to do it in a way that was organized, legal, and uh, 
it worked. One of the, and I want to come back to this um, quote that you just read, because uh, I think it touches on some really interesting points about the civilian population in and around these encampments and, and central New Jersey. Um, but before we do, you know, kind of going back to the comparison of Valley Forge and these other encampments, particularly the second encampment at, at Morristown, you know, why do you think that uh, when it comes to American memory or, or, or the memory of even the veterans that talk about their experiences, you know, Valley Forge is the one that often gets not only talked about, but the one where, you know, there's the painting of Washington praying in that wild snowstorm. And we think about the snowstorms at Valley Forge, which really wasn't as a lot of snow as compared to what they get in Morristown. We think about the cold at Valley Forge. Yeah, it was cold, but again, it wasn't as severe at, as the winter uh, at Morristown. Why do you think in, in the memory of these encampments or the memory of the Revolutionary War that, you know, at least the, the American mind, if not those studying abroad as well, continually come back to Valley Forge? Why isn't Morristown remembered um, as significantly in popular American memory as, as Valley Forge is? Good question. I think there's a couple things. Uh, one is that the, uh, the army at Valley Forge uh, absolutely suffers from lack of supplies, but the army is, it's more of a disorganization and inefficiency problem. Uh, Valley Forge is the first major encampment where you have 10, 12,000 troops uh, camped in one location and trying to survive a winter. Uh, so the supply situation isn't very good. Uh, the hygiene, you know, the layout of the camp, they're learning as they go. When they're at that, that Morristown encampment, they've done this and, and they're, they're better organized. They're, they're veterans at building huts and they're more efficient. And even though the supply situation is still bad and the winter is much worse, uh, there are fewer deaths. And um, I think Valley Forge stood out for that reason because uh, it was their first real experience and it, it was a tough uh, winter with a lot of losses, whereas Morristown was a harsher winter, but they didn't suffer as many deaths. I think Von Steuben's a big part of that too. When the army goes into Valley Forge, the army hasn't fought together a lot and, and melded as one continental army. Uh, units from different states are still using different manuals and uh, different uh, orders and drill. And von Steuben simplifies everything and makes one common drill manual for the entire army. And, and he trains the army and the army is transformed. That, that's absolutely true at Valley Forge. So it's important for that reason at Morristown, that army has already gone through that. And, and again, they're veterans. Uh, they don't need that, that drill and training. So Valley Forge stands out because the army was transformed. So I think that's part of it too. Well, you know, I think that's a, a really great breakdown of, you know, the comparison of Valley Forge and um, that of some of these encampments in central New Jersey. And it's an awesome chapter uh, in your book. And for those of us that are just joining us this evening that got on a little late, uh, we have Bert Dunkler with us this evening, a historian and author. He's got a new book out uh, in the Emerging Revolutionary War series, Unhappy Catastrophes, uh, Central New Jersey in the Revolution. Um, you know, one of the things that you, you discussed, uh, that you read for us, you shared with us, is that quote by Washington, um, having reverence for the local civilian population, but, um, you know, trying to walk that line between following the laws, but impressing um, you know, upon the local populace requisition of supplies, you know, one may make that tangential uh, leap, if you will, and maybe more of a skip or a hop than a leap, that not all the citizens in central New Jersey or in, in the greater New Jersey areas um, would be wild about that idea of the Continental Army coming and procuring their animals and their, their grains, their, 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 their backstocks, if you will, of, of crops and whatnot, um, which could very well anger the local population and drive some into the arms of the Loyalist camp. Um, talk to us a little bit about the, 
the home front in New Jersey uh, and a little bit about how that kind of ties into the loyalist population. Is it what we see in New England? Is it what we see in the um, you know, Southern theater? Share with us a little bit about the, the, the home front in central New Jersey during the war. Sure. Uh, you know, the loyalist aspect of the war is fascinating and loyalism is different in every region. Uh, in the Carolinas and you know, the Southern colonies, uh, there's, there's other reasons why people are loyal and there's a backstory to it because there've been a lot of violence and tension on the frontier and the revolution just makes that situation worse. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic area, uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, a lot of people had, uh, of course, family ties and economic ties to England. And the Continental Army's presence and their policies are unpopular and fall harsh on a lot of the population. New Jersey is unique in that they raised about as many troops for the Continental Army as for the Loyalists. Wow. There were several Loyalist units that were organized in New Jersey. And because it's so close to New York, which is held by the British, it's easy to get to New York and get, get to safety if you're uh, a Loyalist. And several thousand troops from New Jersey are organized in New York to fight for the British. Wow. Um, and New Jersey is on the front line. I mean, the, the Hudson and, you know, the Hudson uh, is right there, Staten Island. It, you, you can throw a stone <laughs> practically from New York to New Jersey or vice versa. And so the British will launch raids into New Jersey. Uh, the Americans will launch raids into British held New York and Staten Island. And uh, that goes on through the whole, the whole war. You know, New York, fell very early uh, in the summer, late summer of 1776, and the British occupy it for the rest of the war. So the Americans always have troops in the Hudson area to keep an eye on the British in case they come across. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of raids, and some of it's for forage, some of it's for intelligence, uh, capture prisoners, things like that. But uh, for the communities along the Hudson and like around uh, Perth Amboy and, and that area, New Brunswick, uh, they're always in the line of fire. The, uh, the British are in the state for a while with their main army. So as it marches through, you know, they're causing devastation just like the Americans. And um, the, the governor of New Jersey, uh, Livingston, I think does a great job trying to hold it together. The state organizes a new constitution and organizes a militia system and organizes a state government, just like all the other states do, but they're doing with British troops present in their state and, and on its border. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fascinating things going on. And it goes back to my earlier point that the war never left New Jersey. You know, the the American and British armies will will leave Boston and not come back. Uh, when they when they invade Pennsylvania and go up through Brandywine and Philadelphia, uh, yeah, they cause devastation. And then they leave and they don't come back. Uh, Virginia really doesn't feel the war until the end. So this is a place where the war is constantly there. Yeah, it sounds, you know, almost like, uh, you know, I started off as a 19th century uh, American military historian, uh, you know, trying to not say the big CW word here on the... Uh, on it's the, okay, uh, you, you, you can say it. <laughs> you know, it, the way that, that you write the narrative of the book, you make a very compelling argument uh, as, it, as it relates to central New Jersey that, you know, New Jersey and, and this particular area of New Jersey is almost like the Virginia of the American Civil War, um, that the local populace is constantly experiencing the hard hand of war, both by the Continental Army and the British Army, encampment after encampment, uh, raid after raid, battle after battle. It's ever present, as you mentioned, um, throughout the narrative of your book. So talk a little bit then, uh, one of the things that, that you mentioned is some of the raids, but also some of the battles. Uh, you know, I think within the last perhaps maybe 15 years or so, the idea of the 10 crucial days has really moved to the forefront of American Revolutionary War history and really putting on the map 
you know, Trenton and Princeton. But obviously there's other actions in New Jersey. Um, and you have a great chapter on uh, highlighting some of those battles and some of those raids. Um, give us a quick overview of, of some of the important moments in the military aspect of New Jersey's uh, role in the American Revolutionary War outside of, of the big two of uh, Trenton and Princeton. Yeah, uh, one of the things that is gonna be different about this book in the series is that it's not about a major battle or an event. Uh, like like Valley Forge or Lexington and Concord. Um, but I thought it was important to cover these smaller, lesser known things and they're building blocks. Like I said earlier, the, these smaller actions help build the army, give the continental army experience. So there are uh, the engagements at, at Trenton and Princeton uh, in uh, Je December, January, and then that spring of 1777, we have what's called the Forage War. And there, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned here. The British occupy part of the state around New Brunswick, and they've got to support their troops and, and get forage for their horses. And the Americans are on the outskirts of the British uh, controlled area. And every time the British send out foraging parties to get food and, and supplies, they get ambushed. And it just escalates. And sometimes the British set traps. They send out dummy foraging parties to lure the Americans in. And this thing just goes, goes on all through the spring. Small, small scale actions, regimental company size. But it wears the British down, absolutely. And then we get into the spring and summer of 1777 and there's some decent sized battles. They're not big, but we have engagements at places like Bound Brook and the Short Hills. These involve several regiments or brigades at a time. And again, it's the first time that these American troops have fought in a, in a battle that size. So they're getting experience maneuvering. They're getting experience fighting, you know, in line with other regiments next to them. And for, for anyone who studies, you know, whether it's Civil War, Revolution, you know, that, that's an important concept to, to get that experience, for officers to get that experience coordination of units, moving into and out of combat, um, you know, extricating themselves and, you know, all that goes with it. So we have some engagements like that. And the next big battles that, that these troops will all fight is Brandywine. So this, this helps build up the experience for the Americans and for the British and the German troops, learning how to fight in this country and learning how to maneuver uh, on, on a large scale. There are several cavalry raids uh, that, that occur through the area. Uh, the British launched a couple cavalry raids to uh, destroy American supplies and capture supplies of their own. Late in the war, the British launched a major foraging expedition into the northern part, uh, Bergen County, uh, to gather supplies. You know, the, for the British, their stuff comes from 3,000 miles away. Yeah. Uh, Largely. So they're always looking for, for supplies. But the military parts of it are important. They're not the big battles like we think of, like Monmouth and Trenton, but they're lesser known battles that are important. And one of the things I also wanted to emphasize is the importance of preservation, because with the 250th anniversary coming up in the state of New Jersey, National Park Service, the Battlefield Trust, uh, a lot of the groups that, that we're all familiar with and, and support will all be working together. And there's tremendous opportunity at some of these sites, even if a lot of them are built over or there's not much to see right now, there's still potential at some of these sites. And I wanted to, to emphasize that, that we, we should look for that opportunity and not, not think that it's, it's too late. Yeah, you have got gr uh, two great appendices in the book um, that specifically talk about that. Uh, a great appendice by uh, uh, Jim Lighthizer um, from the American Battlefield Trust on you know, why we need to preserve Revolutionary War battlefields um, of all sizes, not just your, you know, your Monmouths and your Trentons and your Princetons, but also many of these other locations that you talk about in the book. Um, and underscoring um, Jim's appendix and, and, and your own discussion um, on the importance is looking at you know, the archeological aspects of the Revolutionary War. You have a great appendix um, there 
uh, written on the archaeology of these these locations within New Jersey, and that archaeological record helps to not only for us further our knowledge and understanding, but underscore why we need to preserve these places because of that that importance. Um, one of the things I wanted to go back to that you touched on was the necessity of you know British foraging uh, you know operations that lead to many of these smaller scale actions which uh, you know, from a military standpoint are, are really that proving and training ground, as you mentioned. Um, you know, what's the old saying, you know, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. And I, I equated you know, your parts of the narrative um, of these foraging expectations and what New Jersey is cranking out on the home front in way of uh, material and food and rations for both armies. Uh, New Jersey comes across as really the breadbasket um, of the mid-Atlantic region for both of these armies to continue to operate. Um, so, uh, you know, that ties into our earlier discussion of, you know, why are we having encampments here in this area? Um, because of, of the output that New Jersey is, is able to uh, produce on the home front. And I think folks will really be able to dig into those chapters on these foraging expectation, or expeditions that, that continue to grow uh, throughout the 1770s and into the early 1780s. Um, talk to us a little bit, uh, we mentioned the foraging war. Um, talk to us a little bit about the war on the plains. It's, a, it's something I had never really come to fully appreciate and understand, um, it, but uh, it was eye-opening to say the least uh, in your book, talk to us a little bit or give us an overview of, of what that really was and, and, and the key players and factors in it. So uh, the uh, there's some mountain ranges, uh, Wachton Mountains in the uh, sort of upper part of the state where Washington has his army and they can look down on the British, they can keep an eye on them and they're protected in, in the mountains. And uh, in the summer of 1777, uh, General William Howe with the British Army is coming out of New Brunswick and he's trying to lure Washington out to fight a major battle. Uh, and that, that, that's kind of the, <laughs> the, the strategy that Howe is going to use throughout his time in North America is, is trying to get Washington into a major battle where he, where he can defeat him because he probably can because uh, his army is simply better, at, at least at this point. And Washington never falls for that but there are several uh, close calls where the, the troops engage and Washington pulls back before he commits his whole army. And at one point, Howe considers marching overland from New Jersey to Philadelphia. Wow. Obviously he decides to take the water route instead, going around and, and up through the Chesapeake Bay, uh, landing uh, head of Elk in Maryland. But uh, there are a couple smaller battles, uh, like the Short Hills, where uh, the Americans are getting, like I said, a measure of combat experience. And it, it's a series of actions and maneuvers and engagements that just don't get a lot of attention. Uh, there's not much preserved at these sites. Most of them have historic markers, but there's not necessarily parks or battlefields uh, to visit. But part of the story, part of that progression uh, as the war advances. You know, the longer the war goes on, the harder it is for the British to win in, in the sense that the Americans get more combat experience, their army gets better trained and becomes more legitimate. And European recognition, you know, the French are watching very closely. So for the British, it's in their best interest to end this thing as quickly as possible. And they can't do it, obviously. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that I really appreciated um, about your book and what makes it, you know, unique to this series is, is it doesn't really focus on a battle or one particular side or, you know, some important figure like a biography, but um, which we have coming down the road. So folks, stay tuned as, as ERW series continues to, to expand. Um, you know, as I'm reading about these smaller actions, first of all, I had never really put it together as, as kind of a cohesive, almost campaign, if you will, you know, as what you call the war on the plains. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going through and I'm reading I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to visit this spot, visit that spot. <laughs> uh, 
you know, at the end of every chapter, you have this list of, of sites to visit as it relates to your narrative. You know, you've got the, the, the hours, if there's hours of operation, the addresses, which I pretty much have just planned out my, my spring and summer. Spending, You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Spending time, more time in New Jersey. Um, I, you know, I, I take a pause to share a, uh, a quick story. My first time ever going to New Jersey um i had you know, flown into to philadelphia and drove and was heading through trenton and princeton brown had a great time the rental car needs some gas so i pull out i pull into the gas station uh, you know a good uh -oh. midwesterner i hop out and grab the handle and i'm getting open the, the gas tank door and i got a guy coming running at me yelling i'm like what is going on what why is this gentleman i, I don't get it I can't pump my own gas in New Jersey. Um, you broke the law, Dan. I, I broke the law, uh, all for the love of, of Revolutionary War battlefield visits. Um, but um, so a great part of the book, um, you know, many of the ERWS books have a, you know, a tour that kind of ties into the battle as it progresses or the campaign. But this is really going to take you a lot of different places and see a lot of these, these number of, of smaller sites. So I've got to ask you, as you're researching over the years, the role of Central New Jersey, you're, you're writing this book, you're visiting these sites to get uh, pictures in this book. And there was stuff I had never seen before as I was going through this, uh, uh, reading this. What are some of your favorites? What were some of those places where, you know, you said, this is a cool spot, I need to share this with folks, or, you know, this is... This right here is a spot that really takes me back to, to this era or some of the highlights of, of visiting these places and researching writing about them. I just want to say in general, uh, I love local history museums and, and little out of the way historic sites. Uh, you know, the, the big, big places like state parks and national parks obviously are great too, but it's those little sometimes hidden gems. And, and sometimes they're, they're maybe not the best well run, best staffed, best funded, but they often have some some really neat stories and neat artifacts. And it's important to support local history because uh, those places need to need to survive. They they preserve important parts of local history. But um, the Baylor massacre, as it's called, in uh, the upper part of the state, uh, American dragoons cavalry were camped and were surprised uh, in the middle of the night by British troops. Many of them were bayoneted and were buried in mass graves. And those graves were excavated by archeologists, I believe in the seventies. And uh, I, I talk about that and, and went there and there's, there's a great memorial and several historic markers. Uh, that's a really neat site. Another one was Bound Brook, which is a battle in which uh, the British and German troops attack the American garrison from two sides. And the, the Germans, the, specifically the Hessian Jaegers, the riflemen, are crossing over a stone bridge. And today that stone bridge is still there, but it's buried under modern development. But you can wow. still see part of the remnants of that stone bridge. And I love finding things like that. That's awesome. So th those are two that stand out to me. Um, you know, Morristown has so many great stories. Once you di dive in a little deeper below the, you know, the, the general history that you might get and really spend time in Morristown learning about the encampment and the individual things that happened there. Th there's just so much all over. You know, there was... Some of the stops I was writing down uh, I, on my list already is the First Presbyterian Church. I believe it was in Elizabethtown. Um, I got to I've got to go back to Morristown. I definitely, you know, I, I went through the visitor center and then did a little bit of the driving tour. I'm like, OK, cool. It's an encampment. But after going through this and really digging deeper um, into, into your book, um, I, I think the best way to encapsulate uh, your newest book is is that it it tells the story of the micro, uh, microcosm of, of the American Revolution. Um, literally every aspect that, that you know, one will think about when it comes to you know, any period of warfare, but in particular the American Revolution, you know, the home front, battles and leaders, politics, um, logistics, um, supplies, 
encampments, training, uh, foraging, every aspect, it really occurs uh, in, in central New Jersey. And I think that really comes to the forefront uh, in your book. And like I said, you make a very compelling argument um, for the importance and the role of, of this area and the colony at large in New Jersey in the American Revolution. Um, there is so much stuff packed into your narrative. I want to give you an opportunity to maybe tell perhaps a story or two that uh, you came across or something that was you always wanted to tell um, that we didn't cover tonight in our topic uh, and in our discussion. But um, maybe something that uh, doesn't give away the candy store. We want you folks to go out it, it, in time for the holidays to get Bert's new book on happy catastrophes. But um, maybe a, a share a story or two with us before we wrap up this evening. Uh, one thing that I'll mention is uh, getting back to the civilian side of things. Uh, because the state is on the front lines and does have a divided population and the British can so easily come over and uh, loyalists are strong in certain areas it's, it's really something uh, to think about. Uh, there, there isn't freedom of speech. Mm. If you're on the patriot side or the, the revolutionary side, the, you know, there, there isn't a choice. Um, you know, the, the government has to be, the state government has to enforce uh, its policies to, to run the war. And just like Washington had to take from the civilians, um, you know, there, there are some difficult choices that these people made and that um, people had to live with. And that just stood out to me that uh, for the civilians, it's not just about their stuff being taken and their crops being trampled, uh, freedom of movement, being able to express themselves. Uh, a lot of those things that in other states, they don't have the oppression, but it, if you lived in these parts of New Jersey, uh, you did, you did have to deal with those things. And maybe it's not fair, maybe it's not right, but to win the war, that's what they had to do. The other thing I'll, I'll point out, and you didn't ask about it, but I'm sure people are wondering about the title. Yes, that's a wonderful question. You get to it in the narrative, um, but tell us, unhappy catastrophes, how does that relate to New Jersey in the American Revolution? Well, you see, this way we can call it the unhappy book. <laughs> so that, you know, there's the Monmouth book, there's the Camden book, there's the unhappy book. Um, I was looking for a good title and, you know, I came across a couple ideas. I like to use quotes. Yes. Uh, original uh, words from the participants. And this is a quote from Washington who talks about the unhappy catastrophes that will follow if the British get across the Hudson. And of course they do. Uh, the British are able to control the Hudson and cross it multiple times and actually whenever they, they want to pretty much. But I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of a neat phrase, but it applies in so many ways to, um, you know, the battles that happen. You know, there's a lot of unhappiness for the continental troops, for the British, for the loyalists, for the civilians. Uh, it, it sort of in, it captures the struggles uh, that these people went through. And of course, uh, for some, there is going to be a happy ending, but not for everybody. And that's the way history is. Folks, you definitely are going to want to pick up a copy of Bert's new book, Unhappy Catastrophes, uh, a book titled after a remark that Washington makes uh, during the war, as Bert just shared with us. It's perfect time to get it. Holidays are coming up. That's the latest release in the Emerging Revolutionary War series through Savas Beatty Publishing. Um, Bert, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And before I let you go, uh, would you mind sharing with us, um, now that this one's out, what's next on, on the list? What's, what are you researching? We know you're always uh, you know, splitting that edge between the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, what, what is on the researching block, as they say? A uh, couple things. There's a, a little skirmish in Maryland uh, you might have heard of called Antietam. Hmm. I think some folks may have heard of that one. There may have even been some troops from Ohio there. There, there was. There I'll was. have to check on that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've got uh, something on Antietam I'm working on and uh, something on the French and Indian War, which uh, I've always been fascinated by. 
uh, the French and Indian War in, in Pennsylvania, Braddock and Forbes, and the campaigns that they that they undertook. Well, you're definitely going to want to look for those next projects um, by Bert Dunkerley, excellent author and historian, brings it to life, takes you to these places. Bert, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Folks, join us again in two weeks for our next installment of Emerging Revolutionary Wars Sunday Night Revelries. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Uh, just a quick note as we end, tonight's program was previously recorded. Many of us are on our way back from the second annual ERW bus tour. If you have any questions for Bert, please feel free to drop us a line at emergingrevolutionarywar at gmail.com. Again, the email address is emergingrevolutionarywar at gmail.com, or you can drop us a message uh, via our Facebook page, and we'd be happy to get those to Bert. If anything uh, jogged your, your, your interest tonight and you, you have some questions for our author. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.